Okay, I got the green light from Nick, so let's go ahead and get started. We're here today to talk about setting up an internal dark pan. Um, before I get too far into it, I wanted to thank the organizers of this conference. Uh, organizing a conference, uh, in my own experience, is a tremendous undertaking, and I don't assume that it would be any less of a tremendous undertaking when you have to, in very short notice, shift the entire thing online. So. Really good job to everybody involved, Nick and uh, Todd Rinaldi and everybody else who's been involved in this process. Um, my name is Dave Oswald. I work for Endurance International Endurance Group. Um, I'm a principal software engineer there and I work on a team that focuses on hosting orchestration. Um, I'm also a dad, a programmer, cyclist, sailor, among other things. Um, so I wanna thank Endurance for letting me be here uh, and for letting me present today. Uh, and for everything they've done for my career. Uh, endurance is often hiring. Uh, we have a website, careers.endurance.com. So if anybody's interested in seeking a career with endurance, you can go ahead and reach out to me uh, or go to that website. But reach out to me at daoswald.gmail.com or at my endurance email, either way. Enough of that, we're here to talk about setting up an internal dark pan. Um, First, the first question that comes up, well, what is a dark pan? And uh, I did, I, I think a lot of us intuitively kind of know what it is. I did some searching and I found that a few years ago, Olaf uh, posted a tweet. Uh, what do you think of when you hear the word dark pan? And he presented some options and people responded. He got uh, 79 participants to respond to that. And uh, the, the winning uh, option was Perl code that is not in the CPAN. Um, the other options being a mini CPAN containing Perl code that is not in the CPAN, uh, both of the above and none of the above. And so I put that through some intense statistical analysis and came up with my own conclusion that DarkPan is a code repository that uses CPAN tooling, uh, but that isn't CPAN. Um, we had a problem. We have 120 kind of general purpose modules within my organization. Uh, some of those modules are useful for some types of services and some for others, uh, but basically 120 general purpose modules. And uh, not all of them are, most of them are not really generally useful. Most of them are not generally releasable to the public uh, for one reason or another. We'd like to work on that. At some point, some of them may be releasable. Currently in their current state, they're not. Um, we want to be able to use those modules a la carte in standalone microservices. Um, so then we need to kind of investigate, well, what is a microservice? So microservice, I went to microservices.io and looked it up. Uh, they are an architectural style that structures an application as a collection of services that are highly maintainable and testable. Very importantly, loosely coupled, independently deployable, organized around business capabilities and owned by small teams. So because they are loosely coupled, independently de deployable and owned by small teams, it doesn't make a lot of sense to pull our 120 generally useful modules in to a microservice, you know, the entire kitchen sink when we really, when we really only may need one or two uh, or three of those generally useful modules. Uh, so we want to avoid, avoid kitchen sink programming and tight coupling. Um, a typical Perl microservice might be a Docker container that consists of uh, Perl and consists of Carton for dependency management. Uh, it might have Modulicious or Dancer as kind of a front end. Uh, there will be some proprietary modules, some CPAN modules, and then some application uh, logic and very specific business logic modules that represent the model. Uh, and we might deploy it into OpenShift or into AWS. Uh, we want to avoid not invented here syndrome as much as possible, which means we want to leverage CPAN. Uh, but we also want to be able to leverage some of the previous work in our 120 or so general purpose modules. Uh, often within these types of microservices that are dockerized into containers, we'll use Carton for dependency management. Uh, Carton is a module written by Miyagawa. It's a fantastic uh, it's a fantastic way of dealing with, uh, with CPAN module dependencies that we need to pull into our, into our little containers. 
Um, I had ever previously used Carton for split dependency management, for, de for managing dependencies between CPAN and also between an internal dark pan. So, but if you look at how, how Carton works, it uses a CPAN file, and the CPAN file is used to specify the dependencies that our container or that our little uh, application requires. And so you can, uh, this is taken directly from the pod from, from Carton. You can require Plaque, require, require Starman, whatever modules you need to require, you specif specify them in their CPAN file. Um, but we don't want to mirror all of CPAN on our dark pan, which means we need to be able to split our dependency management between both CPAN and dark pan. We need Carton to be able to do both. And so uh, we need kind of this hybrid approach. So my first uh, thought was, well, let's, let's uh, check Stack Overflow as every, as every good developer does and see, uh, see how we can make Carton use both CPAN and dark pan. And I came up with, as you can see, zero results uh, on that, not surprisingly, perhaps. Uh, next, turn to Google, and I found a fantastic article that was written back in 2017, a nice little blog that talks about using Carton for internal dark pan. Uh, and I found this in particular, that you can specify and Perl Carton mirror. And I thought that I had everything figured out, and we uh, set off to use this M part carton mirror and for some reason never could get that quite working. But then we'd finally turn to where developers ought to turn first back to the documentation for carton and realized, oh, holy cow, there it is. Uh, you can specify a mirror and this will allow us to default to using CPAN as our, uh, in our CPAN spec files for carton, but we can specify a mirror for our local dark pan if we want to do that for specific modules within our CPAN file. Problem solved, uh, we went down rabbit holes that we didn't need to. So now the next step is we need to make a dark pan. Uh, and to make it a, part, a dark pan, we need to prepare our, we, we wanted to use CPAN tooling as much as possible, so we need to prepare our modules into distributions. Uh, we need to create a dark pan host and then we need to make our we need to distribute our modules to our dark pan host. Uh, so step zero for us was to create a Jenkins pipeline. And you can see I circled down there. We created two pipelines, one for our core lib dark pan beta build and one for our production build so that we can stage our, uh, stage our modules into a beta environment first and make sure that they're working there first and allow our consumers to try them out there first. Um, we created, you can see we created the Jenkins pipeline, uh, I guess you just call them Jenkins, Jacob, Jenkins pipelines. Um, so if that's, we've created, we finished step zero. Step one, we, now to, we need to now move on to preparing our modules for distribution. Problem is we have 120 modules and the 120 modules are living in just a uh, big monolithic repository right now that we call CoreLib. And uh, they are not set up for, for spewing into distributions easily. Um, they're not nice, tidy CPAN little distributions. Uh, the way CPAN distributions work is you want them, you want a CPAN distribution to have a, obviously the library itself, the library that you're trying to distribute, you want a make file. Um, and then you've got your tests and a bunch of other stuff in your CPAN distributions. Uh, on the other hand, we have just a bunch of modules. So what are we gonna do? Well, what are the necessary things for CPAN distribution? The absolute bare necessities, the minimum requirements for CPAN distribution are the modules that you're trying to distribute, the make file that you want to build your distribution and, and test it and all that. And then the manifest and, and the metadata. The metadata is used by the CPAN indexer. Those are essentially what are required for a minimal CPAN distribution. We have our 120 something general basic modules all lumped together. So, uh, but we need, and they're just in a regular hierarchical file system like this. 
So the idea is let's auto generate 120 module distributions. If people have questions, I can't see because I'm not looking at uh, the chat at the same time. But, okay, we're gonna auto generate 120 module distributions. The steps that we need to follow are to find the module source, uh, copy it into a distribution working directory, create a make file, do the make dance so that we can use CPAN tooling for the rest and then repeat that 120 times. So we wrote a, wrote a little Perl to do it for us. Um, the Perl starts by looping over uh, each of the 120 plus modules that we have. Uh, for each of them, we're gonna do this using Parallel Fork Manager. As you can see, I have some of that set up. Um, for each of those modules, we're going to create a distribution temporary directory. We're gonna go ahead and populate that directory uh, with the module's information. I'll look at that in just a moment. Here's the code that does that. The first step is to copy the module, uh, the, the module source itself into our distribution directory for that module. If the module has a separate pod sidecar, then we'll go ahead and copy that in. And then we're gonna let CPAN, or we're gonna let Perl tooling, Perl toolchain do the rest for us. So we're going to create a make file and that make file will handle the rest of the turning this into a distribution. So we have a very minimal make file and you can see that we just templatized our make file creation. Um, so in our template, we specify the name of the module, the version, we get the version from the pod. Uh, if the pod happens to be in a pod sidecar, then we get the version from the pod sidecar instead and same with, or we get the abstract from the pod sidecar instead. Uh, we have to target a minimum Perl version of 5.10, so we know that all of our modules do already work with Perl 5.10. Not everything that we do uses 5.10. We have some things that use more modern per versions of Perl, but some of our uh, some of our services need to be able to target 5.10. Uh, we are we, for our internal service. We set up that we're just EIG is the author. <clears throat> Everything's templatized. And then we just process our template using, it's a pretty pretty close to standard template, tool, template toolkit stuff. We use a different template system called Template Alloy, but it's just a wrapper around Template Toolkit that provides a few additional things. Template, allo, template alloy, is, alloy is on CPAM. So we've populated the build dir. Uh, we just looked at the code to do that. The next thing is to build the distribution. In building a distribution, you need to do the, the typical dance. This is what module authors typically or, or quite often will do. They'll run Perl makefile.pl, they'll make, they'll make the manifest, make the distir, the disk directory. They'll copy the meta out of the disk directory and then they'll make the dist. Uh, we copy the meta so that we have a fresh copy of auto-generated meta us usable by the CPAN indexer. That'll come later. And then we make our distribution. So now we need, we need to automate this process for our 120 temporary build directories or temporary distribution directories. The steps, we, walk through, we wanna walk through these steps. So we have some more code to do that. Uh, we've created a chain of commands that need to run. The chain of commands will be just as we saw before, run the make file, make, make manifest, make distor, uh, make the, and then find the meta that showed up in our distor and copy it over to our target directory. After that, we do some hand wavy sanity checks and version, version bump checks, which are not terribly interesting at the moment. So I'll skip past those. And then we finally will make dist. When we make dist, we should now have a tarball. Uh, for our Perl distribution. Remember, we're doing this 120 times. 
So we've now gone through our loop. We've uh, populated our, dis our builder and we've then used that builder to build a distribution. This is in a temporary directory. We've done that for each of the modules. The next step is to build a prototype dark pan. So to build the prototype dark pan, well, how do we do that? Don't really know how to do that. So we're gonna go look on uh, CPAN again and see what we can find. And it turns out, of course, that a dark pan is just a type of a CPAN mirror. Um, it just happens to be a type of a CPAN mirror that doesn't mirror CPAN. Um, that's a vampire there who doesn't reflect. Um, so our next step is to build this dark pan prototype. So I go back to CPAN again and say, well, certainly tooling exists to do this sort of thing. And I was not uh, disappointed. I found CPAN mirror tiny, found a lot of good modules, but CPAN mirror tiny provided just enough of what I needed. Um, if we look at the documentation for CPAN mirror tiny, we see that there's a method called inject and it has several derivative methods. One of them happens to be direct local file. So previously in my in the previous steps that I worked through, we created 120 tarballs. Um, we can now use inject local file to inject those 120 tarballs into our prototype for a dark pan. Um, so the bare essentials for a CPAN mirror need to be uh, the O2 packages details.txt.gz file, that's the index file, and then the distributions in form of tarballs, tar.gz's. <clears throat> so let's look at some code again. We're going to start by instantiating our CPAN mirror tiny instance and giving it a base destination to deploy to. And then we're going to walk through uh, each of our tarballs that we created we're going to inject those tarballs into our distribution one by one. And when we're done injecting them into our distribution, we're going to go ahead and write out our index, compress. I mean, it, it seems really simple. There was a lot of fiddling to figure it all out, but it, it, it actually is pretty simple once you get it figured out. It's a time to mention this. Never release anything, even a one word documentation patch without incrementing the number, the version number. Even a one word documentation patch should be, should result in a change in version at the sub minor level. This is found in Perlmod style, Perldoc Perlmod style. So we created some tests uh, to verify that when people make code contributions to our core li libraries, that they do version bumps. Uh, our tests are capable of verifying, but also fixing if they didn't do a version bump and then committing the fix if they ch choose to do it that way. Um, these tests are automatically run by Bamboo every time there's a uh, commit. So before a pull request can be merged, uh, the tests have to be passing. Bamboo enforces this. So we enforce that version bumps happen within the core lib. The next step is to automate the build. And so what does that look like? Our build, uh, we start with stash or Bitbucket, which is our, our source repository. It's similar to Git, except that it's, uh, it's from Atlassian. Uh, we have Jenkins monitoring Bitbucket. And when Jenkins finds that changes have, that, that changes have, ha changes have happened in the master branch or that a new merge to master has happened, it pushes that uh, over to a build server the build server runs the code that I showed you before, uh, and then it pushes it out to the mirror. Well, the mirror picks it up and pulls it over. And at that point, microservices can rebuild themselves uh, and can catch the new versions that have showed up on our mirror. I showed you before that we have uh, pipelines built out. We're gonna look a little bit more closely at those pipelines. But before that, we need to look at what we did in Bitbucket. Well, there's a webhook that we created in Bitbucket that any time uh, that any time a merge to master happens, Jenkins is able to see that that merge to master took place. 
Jenkins then kicks off this pipeline. Uh, we wrote the, this little pipeline code, which lives in our core lib repository. The pipeline code uh, runs on the build server. If I go back a couple slides, it runs on the build server. Uh, and all that it does is it runs the, the code that I showed you previously, dpan dist build. So that's our Jenkins file. We created one Jenkins file for, for production and a separate one, a separate one called Jenkins file dot beta dot dpan for our beta uh, pipeline. Um, so Jason, Paul, go ahead and click merge for me. Uh, that's the two people that, whose pictures are there. And then we get uh, a build taking place. This is Jenkins, picks up that build. You can see that uh, we did this actually earlier today. Uh, and uh, we build out our, we push it over to the production server. The build took about 30 seconds. And it, you can see it ran through a bunch of things. What did it run through? Well, this part here, you can see it's running my code. It's making the manifest uh, for us. It's discovering that we have versions that didn't change that can be skipped. We're only going to create manifests for those that, uh, we're only gonna create manifests and make files and, and, uh, and distributions for those that have had a version bump. We skip the rest. And then uh, we go ahead and uh, build our distribution. That all of our distributions took 23 seconds to build, all of the ones that changed. Uh, it took a few more seconds well, it took 0.46 seconds to create a prototype dark pan off of our new distributions. And so the entire process was 23 and a half seconds uh, for the modules that changed in our most recent release. Uh, success. And if we watch our Jenkins build as it's happening, we can see that uh, there we are 24 seconds uh, to do the build. And for some reason, the, uh, the higher level view told us that it's 30 seconds, but whatever. So on the dark pan mirror, if I, I should have put another slide here for this. If I go back a few slides, you can see that we had the build server uh, as a kind of a prototype for the dark pan. And then we have the, the mirror server that is the actual dark pan. Let's skip ahead again. On the dark pan mirror, we have a cron that uh, monitors the build server. And its job is just to use rsync. It looks at the build server when things have changed, it uses rsync and it pulls them over to the mirror. And really all that it's pulling over is the uh, index file and the distribution tarballs themselves. Uh, on the build server, on the, on the mirror server, we have just a container, a Docker container that's running a little application, a little web app, and that web app exposes a public directory that it, and the public directory is where we pull down all of our, uh, it's an external path that we pull down to the mirror for all of our uh, tarballs. And this is perhaps the stupidest thing ever. Uh, inside of OpenShift, we couldn't get Nginx to, uh, to serve up the content. We, Docker, I'm sorry, OpenShift wanted a Docker container to deploy. The Docker container needed to be running something and the thing that it's running is nothing but a Mojalicious light app that serves out the public directory. Uh, it's doing nothing else. It would, it would have been nice if we could have just gotten Nginx to do the listening for us without all these steps in between, but we couldn't deploy essentially nothing into OpenShift. Um, and we had, to, and so since we had to deploy something, we deployed the smallest thing we possibly could, which was a little Mojalicious light app serving the content for us. Now, um, now we have, this is a fully browsable from, uh, from within our internal networks, uh, dark pan. Uh, you can see that it exposes out the, at, at the standard place, correlate modules, uh, it exposes out the, 
uh, packages details dot text. This is the CPAN index essentially, and it also exposes out um, all of the modules as tarballs. And this is exactly what you would find if you were looking on CPAN. You would find uh, authors ID and then the author hierarchy. So because we're exposing that this way, the common tooling uh, CPAN minus CPAN the CPAN installer, any of the common tooling can now find our internal modules as long as we point them, as long as we point that tooling to the right mirror. So we're done, um, mostly done. Now for the consuming microservices. Uh, any consuming microservice that, that uh, is using Perl probably ought to be using uh, Carton and Carton in Carton we can specify uh, based on what we learned earlier, we can specify for our CPAN modules, we can just use requires. For our internal modules, here we're using an internal module called AND, uh, AND lets us uh, set up things to happen at, at uh, scope teardown. Anyway, uh, inside, to use our internal AND module, we can just point the CPAN file to our internal mirror and it'll find it there for us. Um, okay, so moving on. Next steps. So that, that's essentially everything that we've needed to accomplish to expose our internal, uh, our internal dark pan, to create an internal dark pan and expose it to our, uh, to our customer base or to our internal, our internal consumers. Next steps. Um, things that we didn't handle. We didn't handle at all uh, dependency detection and resolution. We talked about it, we thought we could do it, and we absolutely could have done it, but, uh, but decided ultimately that it wasn't necessary for our purposes. Our internal consumers know our code base and, and can uh, automatically, or they, they can manually themselves specify what, de what dependencies they want to pull in. Uh, one of the reasons that we didn't handle dependency resolution automatically is because some of our code has, conting has contingent dependency dependencies, and we didn't want to force our consumers in to use dependencies that were only based on code paths they would never be exercising. That introduces, I realized, some, fr some fragileness, and we may go back and revisit that at, at a future point. It would not be hard to revisit and change. Um, but our, our current dependency resolution, our, our current uh, make files do not specify a, uh, a prereq underscore PL. Uh, and so we are not handling dependencies at all within our distributions. Um, the other thing that we're not handling is that um, is a web interface. CPAN minus doesn't need a web interface. C the CPAN installer doesn't need an interface. All they need is to fetch the index uh, and then fetch the tarballs based on the index. So we had and all of our internal consumers already use Stash and Bitbucket and already know where to find uh, the documentation for and where to find the modules themselves. They just need for the CPAN tooling to be able to find them. And so we didn't have a need for an internal uh, dark pan web interface at all. Um, So that's left as an exercise for the viewer, sorry. Um, the last thing that we didn't handle was distribution testing. Um, all of our internal uh, Corlib modules automatically get, get tested uh, by Bamboo anytime a pull, rest, pull request is created and we can't merge to master without uh, the Bamboo uh, build uh, passing. So without the test passing. Um, we test them in a variety of environments and uh, and so for, for that reason we didn't build the we didn't pull the tests the test scripts into our uh, distributions. Another reason was that many of our test scripts didn't actually um, we didn't nor we don't have them entirely normalized as to test names matching module names. Uh, when you're automating things, things really need to be to be normalized. So. If you want your tests to be pulled into a into an automated process like this, 
your test names need to match your module names in some predictable way, or you need to build a test index for your modules so that you can automate that process. Uh, we didn't do that. We may revisit it. I actually think there probably is value to, to doing that, um, but that's left for future work as well. Um, not having done a conference in the cloud before, I've arrived at uh, I've arrived at the end a little earlier than I anticipated. So I will go ahead and take questions if people have questions. I'm going to monitor chat because I haven't heard anybody talking at this point. So are there any questions that people would like to discuss or talk about with us? I see a thank you from Christopher White. You're welcome. Um, I will expose these, I will put these slides up on SlideShare um, because I do think that being able to kind of look at the code a little bit more closely is probably valuable. Um, so uh, I'll put them up on SlideShare and uh, I'll post a link somewhere. I'll post it in, this, in Slack for now, um, as soon as I get them posted up to SlideShare. And if, if people have questions or concerns or anything, you can reach me in the Slack for the conference, but you're also uh, welcome to reach me at my any of my email addresses. Uh, I'm happy to talk to people about this. It's, it was a lot of fun creating, a lot of fun doing. And that's everything I have. So go now set up an internal dark pan. Oh, uh, someone asked a question, a couple of questions. Did you look into using Pinto? Yes, I did look into using Pinto. Um, Pinto is fantastic. It was uh, probably heavier tooling than I needed for this specific project. Um, it would let me build out multiple dark pans, as someone mentioned. Uh, and that is actually something that we talked about. Uh, we, there are, th this was not the only repository that we had where we have generally useful um, code. We have another repository we call GT that has a bunch of other generally useful code that we could have pulled down. Uh, we probably will stand that up as a separate independent dark pen. Uh, it's easier to stand up independent separate dark pens than to spew a bunch of things into the same one. Uh, Pinto, may be useful in that process when we when we start adding additional repositories. And I do like the fact that you can pin to old versions. One thing that we're doing in this dark pen is we are never tearing down the old versions. So if our consumers wish to pin themselves to an old version, they can do that. Um, we uh, I did look at the possibility of standing up a web server. So that was the next question is I've used CPAN mini web server and uh, I, uh, and that's coming from uh, Max Karayan. Uh, I probably will, if, if I ever get the time to do it, put a mini web server in front of this so that it is browsable internally. I do see value in that because it exposes our pod out in a more friendly fashion, even for our own internal consumers. And have you considered a mini CPAN? Um, so a dark pan is in a way a mini CPAN, except that it's just our internal content. Uh, you're, you're, you're talking about a mini CPAN as, uh, in, in terms of, of not reaching out to external CPAN, but using the internal one and, or using the external CPAN to populate an internal one that we can then control uh, a little bit more for pinned versions and that sort of thing. We've talked about it. It hasn't been necessary for what we're currently doing, but, um, we are in a situation where in some of our servers were pinned to pretty old versions of modules. Um, some of them were able to iterate onto more recent versions. We do have some value for it. It's just not something that um, my team is working on or needing. Uh, we have another team that, that works with this sort of thing. And I imagine that they've looked at it and considered it. So if there aren't any further questions, I'll thank you all for attending. Um, and 